Open your Bibles to John 14. <clears throat> told you this morning I was going to bring you a message about the rapture. And I find uh, putting this message together very challenging. So it's been through several phases this week. Uh, as the Lord just, uh, re- believe, led me through this and, and showed me how I ought to teach it. And so I am humbled um, and uh, feel completely inadequate to teach something so important. I believe in the heart of every human is the desire to understand three primary things, where we came from, where we are going, and what is our purpose uh, in between those two uh, primary days. And we know that we have learned from the Scriptures that we come uh, from the Father who knit us together in our mother's womb, that He knew us before we were known, even by our parents. We know that our purpose is Uh, to know Him and to make Him known. Uh, The uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism says that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him uh, forever. As we see our purpose from the Scriptures, we see our purpose is that uh, knowledge of God to grow near Him, to uh, seek our way back to Him. And we, we know that that way is through Jesus Christ. And so we come to the question of where are we going? Well, we know where we are going from the Scriptures. We know how that, um, where that destination is. And what we what seems to be a big debate about is how are we going to get there? And how does that all fit together? You know, you can pull, we could just sit up here and read Scripture for the entire 45, 50 minutes, and, and probably do as, as good as anything. There's just so many scriptures that speak to this. First John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And so John spoke of this day when the Lord would be revealed and and that that day when the Lord would be revealed is is a source of hope to us. In 1 Thessalonians 1, it says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had uh, to you, Paul talking to the Thessalonians, and how you turn to God and from idols to uh, serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, when He raised, uh, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And so, to the Thessalonians, He was speaking of waiting for the Son of heaven, who would be revealed and that he is going to deliver us from this wrath that was coming and again we find that idea of being a hope for the believers a source of comfort to them in difficult times one of the things we see it's almost consistent through scripture in these passages that look towards that end time is almost everybody was standing in a difficult place in life They were all standing in a place where they were feeling the pressure of life, the pressures of the world, of their government, of of many things that just seemed to bear down on them to bring this crushing pressure that we can all feel in the days in which we live and that um, this hope is then presented as take your eyes off of all this stuff that's crushing in on you and feel the freedom of Jesus Christ of the day that He is going to remove you from this place and take you home. 
He reminds you of the resurrection and the life. And He holds the keys to death and Hades. At John 14, we would find ourselves in one of those places. It was a troubling time for the disciples. They were um, hearing Jesus talk of this coming time of betrayal. Jesus was beginning to talk to those, to those uh, people that have followed Him. They had left everything, walked away from their lives. They had poured everything they had into following Jesus. And then He begins to tell them that He is going to go away. And they were like, wait, time out. They didn't understand it. We don't want to hear the talk of this going away. And He kept saying, I have to go away. And, I, and, and they did not understand this work. It's done. So this was extremely troubling to them to hear this talk of Him uh, predicting that, that, that there was going to be, that He was going to suffer and, and that He was going to die, that He was going to be taken away from them. And so in, in 14.1 He says, Let not your heart um, be troubled. And he's speaking right after the, uh, Jesus predicted the denial, Peter's uh, denial of the Lord. You can imagine that that would ever happen. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's, uh, in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to Him, Lord, we, we do not know where You are going. And how can we know the way? That's almost that being almost an anger from Thomas, that frustration of this talk of of what is of you going away? Our life has been poured into you, Jesus. What are you talking about? We don't know the way. We don't understand what you're talking about. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. You can only imagine how little that meant to them at that moment in time. When their lives in this world were being threatened everything they believed in was and thought they understood was crumbling before their eyes and part of what jesus is presenting sort of this picture of a jewish wedding it was the uh, the idea of a jewish wedding was that it was uh, it was often arranged and by the father would arrange the bride and the bridegroom and and that the bridegroom would approach the bride and there would be this agreement which became the betrothal that that she agreed to marry him and that there was uh, then the, the, the bridegroom would go away and go to his father's house and he would prepare a room and, and the bride had to be prepared because she didn't know the hour or the time that the bridegroom would come. And, and the bridegroom would go away, go to the father's house, prepare a place and, and it wasn't until the father told the son, you can go get your bride, that the bridegroom would go. And the whole time the bride, can you imagine the anticipation of the bride of this deep longing that this time could go up to a year of betrothal, of, of waiting for the bridegroom to show up, of being prepared to see and, and to be with her husband. And the bride had this deep longing and um, every day of, is today the day, is the, today the day that my bridegroom would come and that that we would have the wedding and that we would be together forever and ever. And this is the picture that is presented that Jesus says that I'm going away to my Father's house and prepare a room for you and I'm coming back. And I tell you that because I want you to know that I'm coming back for you and I will come and get you and I will receive you to me. It's, the, it's what He says. I'm going to receive you to me and, and, and then we would be uh, together forever and ever. We see when we continue in Revelation 4 uh, next week, we'll see the 24 elders uh, clothed in white linen around the throne of God. Which looks to be representative of the church at the throne of God. And there's always debate about some of those things. 
we'll see the seven lamps of fire around the throne of God, which appear to be this a picture of perfection of the Holy Spirit, of the seven spirits of God, the seven lamps of fire. And, and, it, and it appears these seven lamps of fire uh, were the seven fires that were on the lampstands of the seven churches. And it, and it appears that those seven lampstands of the church and these many pictures of the church in heaven and around the throne of God. And we'll see that several times as we go on that that it appears that the church is in heaven, but we don't see any evidence of the church being in these on the earth during all this judgment that we see and we begin to speak about uh, after chapter 4. The seals begin to be broken and we see the judgments of God fall on the earth. You'll see any picture of the church. There's no mention of the church going through any of this stuff. John Russell wrote to the faithful church in Philadelphia, if you remember, and he said this, because you have kept my commands to persevere, I will also keep you from that hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. And so you come to the question of how did the church get to heaven? And this is what the rapture is. And if you've never heard of the rapture or you've heard of the rapture and never really understood it, this is the idea of the rapture, that there is a coming a day when the Lord will appear and bring his people to himself and take them to heaven and, and uh, remove them from the presence of the earth as the nations are judged, judgment begins to fall uh, on the earth and on the nations and, uh, in the end times. And so this is the idea of the rapture. By definition, it's an end times event uh, where the Christians of the world would be caught up. You hear this word caught up, and we'll look at that uh, together and with the resurrected Christians who would precede them and, and come to the Lord and meet the Lord in the air. And so this idea of the rapture we'll see as we spoke of already is that it becomes the source of hope, um, that hope that we'll be reunited to, to the Lord and His people um, in the air in our family, those who have gone before us, the saints, that they would be resurrected. We would meet them and meet the Lord in the air. This source of hope, it's a, also a, a, a vindication of God. Um, it's the vindication of His people and the judgment of the nations, the beginning of that. And it's linked to it so much so. And the idea is that the Lord is bringing His people out so that judgment would come on the nations. And, and it really is a release of a right, the righteous from a troubled world and uh, the removal um, of them. And so a few things I, I want to just mention at the beginning here um, before we get too far, much farther into it. And I think these are things that I feel like will help avoid error. And, and if I could just say, you know, one thing that you remember of studying for the rapture, and studying end times events is context, context. There's so much of what we hear and so much of what we have been received over the years from previous experience, from listening to other teachers, whatever it may be, is so much of it is taken out of context, so much assumption is made, and so much of our own biases are interjected into this because we desire to learn something. And I'll tell you, the, just the one thing is it just came to is to try to set aside those biases as hard as that might be. And it's very difficult. We all bring them to um, church every Sunday. We bring them to the Bible every time we open it. We have biases. And to present those biases to the Lord and just ask that the Holy Spirit would override those biases is an important uh, thing for us to do. It's so easy to take a position and find verses to support your position. And let me tell you, it's so easy for Christians to say, I found my position, I looked up the verses, I found them all, and if you all don't believe like I believe, then you are in sad, sad shape. And that is not, there's nothing biblical about that. There is nothing in the Bible that says we should act that way. And so I said the things I think we need to, um, to take into account to avoid error. Some prophecy 
is for God's people in general. But some prophecy is for the church and some is for Israel. Some is for the nation. Some is for individuals. And don't make the assumption without knowing the context. Don't make assumption that you can just grab a prophecy because it fits your agenda, for, fits what you think it should say. The saints, the church, the elect, and God's people are not all the same thing. And, and so again, context is important. You've got to look at the context. We, we often see, and, and many of these things can be uh, used interchangeably, but they're not always used interchangeably. And so the saints, the church, the elect, and God's people are not all the same. And, and if finally, I think this is the most important thing. If you don't remember anything else about today, if Jesus wanted us to know the, the time of His coming, the way of His coming, and the hour of His coming, and how it fits with all the end times events, it would clearly state such in the Bible, and you wouldn't have to get it off the radio or some your favorite teacher or the book you read uh, in 1970 or whatever. That was what it was for me. That's what all this, my end times understanding was the late great planet Earth, Hal Lindsey, which was fascinating and whet my appetite for prophecy. And since then, it's just uh, sort of grown to where much of that, um, you see it for what it was. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4.13. I'll tell you, I, I've seen, I listen and watch a lot of pastors and listen to a lot uh, particularly prophecy lately, because everybody seems to be studying the uh, end time stuff. But I get frustrated at the um, attitude that is taken so many times. And it's not even about this side or that side, but just that people take this attitude that they have it all figured out. And, uh, and there is just very... Um, I, I, and you're going to see what I believe. I'm going to present what I believe. But I more importantly want to pre present the Scriptures. But there are lots of uh, really um, godly men that have studied the, the Scriptures for many, many years and come to different positions. And so I have a profound respect for those godly men that would arrive at a different thing and I want to listen to them and I read them. And I, and I listen to what they say and take into account what they say. And I think it's important. <clears throat> so we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians uh, 4.13. We're going to start there, or continue there, I guess you should say. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning uh, those who have fallen asleep, lest you a sorrow as others who have no hope. Now for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, uh, God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. And, and for the Lord, verse 16, verse, verse 16, for the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds uh, to meet the Lord uh, in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord and therefore comfort one another with these words. And so he, uh, this idea of the rapture is presented, this idea of being caught up. And that's where the, the concept of rapture comes from. This caught up is the word harpazo. It, is, it means to snatch away. It's, it means to... Uh, it almost means like to rip away, like you rip something out of someone's hand. That it, it almost has this violent feel that is so quick and so happens so fast in the blink of an eye that, that we would be snatched away. 
The, the word rapture is not found in your Bible. But actually, the word rapture comes from, uh, I think it was the Latin uh, Vulgate where this harpazo is uh, translated to rapturo, which is the, where the word rapture comes from. And so the word rapture is not found in your Bible. The idea of rapture is seen uh, all over our Bible in many ways, I believe. And so, to not understand this, Paul says, I, I don't want you to be ignorant. And, and, the, and as strange as it sounds, but to, to, to disregard, to not understand, or attempt to grasp this idea of the rapture will, will literally leave you ignorant of something that God has given us to, to bring comfort, to bring hope. But to, it will leave us in, ignorant and sorrowful and without hope. And so it is important in, in particularly the days in which we find ourselves where we need hope and, and we, need, uh, we need this hope to deal with our sorrow, to deal with the things that we go through in this life and the difficulties in the place that we find ourselves. And, and this is one of the things that is given us that we can keep our eyes on. Paul says specifically, this is the word of the Lord. That we who are alive and remain, those Christians, but he's speaking in the first century to the church, that he is presenting this hope to them, that they could have this hope in that day. They didn't say in a few thousand years the Christians were able to have this hope because that's the ones that'll be very close to the time because this has to happen and that has to happen and then these other things. He doesn't tie it to anything else, but he says, you have this hope that Jesus could come back any day and this hope was to deliver to them. And so we are alive and remain will be uh, until the coming of the Lord. And I think many of these passages point towards the day of the Lord. And, and I think many, we we. Uh, causes some confusion too is that we look at this day of the Lord as one 24-hour period instead of a a uh, season a time that is determined when the Lord would deal with the with the nations and it is the same thing that we'll see in Old Testament prophecies towards Israel and towards Jerusalem that this day of the Lord concept is presented not just as a specific day when God would do come and do all this and but it was a time when God would come and deal with men, meet with men, and judge hearts and judge people and judge nations. And so the Lord um, will descend with a shout, um, with a voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God. Uh, three indications, which is fascinating, uh, just to meditate on those things, that this sh shout and this a voice of an archangel. When I think of the, the shout, what will that shout be? And I think of God um, looking into the tomb and calling Lazarus out, calling Lazarus out of death. And the point was always made, he says, Lazarus, come forth. And it's a good thing he said just Lazarus because when God says come forth, everything is coming forth that can come forth. And so I wonder what this Shout will be if it's not a shout where every one of us hear our name, those who are in Christ, would hear our name shouted to come forth. The voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. And I and I'll talk some more about the trumpet in a minute, but that idea of what we read in Exodus that when you hear that long blast of the trumpet to come to the mountain of God. The dead would precede us. We are alive, would then be caught up to meet them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we would always be with the Lord. And then the, probably the most important part of that is the idea that we can comfort each other with these words. The whole purpose was to comfort one another. There are way too many people missing the whole purpose of this idea, that it's to comfort one another. It's not to plug it into our end time scenario, so that we can write books and preach messages to tell everybody that we've got it all figured out. You don't have to spend five minutes on the internet to find somebody who says, look, nobody knows the hour of day, but let me tell you what day, what hour it'll be. You don't, it's serious. You don't have to wait. You don't have to look very far. 
Everybody says, nobody knows the hour, nobody knows the day. Let me tell you what's going to happen. This is going to happen, and this, and, and they're just making a fool of themselves. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 15. <clears throat> now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And, and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality so that when um, this corruptible has, been, has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? And the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, always knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Flesh and blood cannot inherit uh, the kingdom of God and the idea is that we there, there has to be some change that this this body is not what we will take to heaven with us although there will be a bodily resurrection and as the verse we read in the beginning that we don't know what we'll be like but we'll be like him at the appearing of Christ he says this is I tell you this mystery and the mystery is a word that's used often and it's always this idea that, that something is being revealed that only God knew in the past. And, and so as a mystery is being revealed, it's something that God had shown us pictures of, uh, made some uh, foreshadowing, but it was always kept so, hidden from understanding until the mystery was revealed. He reveals this mystery that not all will sleep, but we shall all be changed uh, the idea of being changed is changed into something different. Uh, escaping this corruption, this body that is corrupted by sin, and that will be changed. And, and it's going to happen in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And you've seen this described and heard this described in many different ways. And it really becomes the shortest amount of time that, that the idea was described that it cannot even be divided anymore. It's the it's the tiniest uh, bit of time when you divide a second and you divide it again and you divide it again until you get down to the tiniest little bit of time. And it's that quick in the, in the blink of an eye, in the twinkling of an eye that this is going to happen. And it's at this last trumpet, and, which is a fascinating idea, this last trumpet. We're not even going to, have a chance if it's a twinkly to my we're not going to have this chance to go is that a trumpet it's just going to be over before we realize and, and we're going to be changed and we're going to find ourselves in this in this new place in this new body and uh, what an amazing event what an amazing thought an amazing con contemplation the trumpet will sound the dead will rise incorruptible and we and we shall be changed. And there will be no, uh, no more death and, and no more sorrow for those in Christ. In, in these instances, and particularly the, the Thessalonians, they, they were concerned because they, uh, 
they knew of this and the, this hope of the Lord's coming, and they thought the Lord's coming back any day now. And then one of the believers died, and they were like, now this person has died, and, and we're afraid that they're not, they've missed out somehow in the Lord's coming back. And that's why you say, no, 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 no. You don't have to be ignorant of that. That person is going to rise. They're going to beat you there. They're going to be there with the Lord and there'll be a bodily resurrection and then we would follow, we'd be, we would be changed and we would meet the Lord in the air. And so this thing that was bothering them so in the midst of all the persecution and all the things that were going on and the difficulty of life in this world, they, they even found their hope damaged in this hope of the Lord's coming. And, and Paul was correcting them when he brought these understandings to them. That this is supposed to be a source of hope. And in this case, he says that, that we would remember this and be steadfast in our faith today. And that we would be immovable in, in our understanding and always abounding in the world, in the work of the, uh, in this world. And I tell you, to be that, that idea of being steadfast and, and immovable, I think the two ideas go together. And I don't think anybody ever said immovable means unteachable. But that we would be unmoved by the things of the world because of the hope we have in Jesus Christ. That we wouldn't be moved off our faith and moved off of our hope in what the Lord's promise would be. There's so many of them... And you see it today. You see churches uh, uh, avoiding this end times discussion, avoiding any talk of the rapture, and even to the point where many just say that they don't even believe in this anymore. And, and many of the arguments is exactly what the Bible says. Well, it hasn't happened yet. We've not seen any evidence of his coming, and therefore he must not be coming. As if our lifetime alone is somehow the measure of what the Lord is going to do or not going to do. And if we've got way down in our life and that we don't see yet, then we must be changing our beliefs. There's just no evidence of that. This idea of the last trumpet is fascinating to me. And, and, uh, and, it, and it's really a signal at that time of man's final redemption, the beginning also of the judgment of God. And it, it, the blow that uh, Joel said, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming uh, for it is at hand. And some link this uh, trumpet to the final trumpet in, um, in Revelation. But Paul knew nothing about the book of Revelation when he wrote this. Paul didn't know anything about the trumpets that John would, would write about, but Paul knew all about the trumpets and their importance of the Old Testament. The trumpets uh, served many purposes, and the, the first use of the word trumpet is in Exodus 19, the verse we read earlier. The trumpet of God, when he heard this long blast at the foot of the mountain, that it was a signal for the people to come to God. And, and the trumpet is the is the yobe. The, uh, the word is used is translated jubilee. Yobe, the jubilees. The trumpet is the jubilee. When the trumpet sounded, it was a come to the mountain of God. That's the jubilee. It's a time of release from bondage, from from debts or when debts are canceled, when all the old rights uh, that were taken away were now um, received back when this new inheritance was received. We see all those examples through the Old Testament when the Yobe, when the Jubilee, when the trumpet, the, this horn was, this trumpet was blasted. The trumpet was to be blown at the Feast of Trumpets as a memorial. It marked the the seventh month, and it began the ten days of awe leading to the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was the only day that the priests went into the Holy of Holies. And they had a lot of preparation to go to the Holy of Holies to take blood and sprinkle the blood in the Holy of Holies. 
And the time leading up to that was between the, the Feast of the Trumpets. The trumpets would be blown. It was 10 days of awe, 10 days of, of contemplation, of meditation on the things of God. Leading up to this one day when they would come in into the presence of God, the priest would, on the behalf of all uh, of the people, the picture of our high priest going before the presence of God to sprinkle His blood that atone for our sins. Some people believe this Feast of Trumpets is the, the memorial trumpet uh, blast from Exodus 19. At the Feast of Trumpets, we say, what does this mean? What does the Feast of Trumpets mean? Nobody knows for sure. But they believe that the Feast of Trumpets is a memorial blast of the trumpets pointing back to Exodus 19, that first trumpet blast that they heard when God says, come to the mountain, when they first met God. That this Feast of Trumpets is to memorialize that moment in time. And so some believe this Feast of Trumpets memorializes that, and that's why you don't have to look very far on the internet for somebody to say that's when the rapture is going to happen. It's going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. It's going to happen on this day. And I don't know. Maybe they're right. Only God knows whether that's the way it is or not. I don't think any of us can sit and speculate to that point. But the idea of the trumpet is it points to these, these, their understanding of the trumpet. And so to make that that connection is probably is definitely more of a leap, a leap than we need to make, or we have a right to make, I believe. In the Old Testament, we see other uses of, of the trumpet. It was blown the first time to strike the tents. The second um, trump was to fall in line, and the last trump was before they marched away. We see the last trump at Jericho uh, brought the walls down. Uh, that, that was the same word, the jubilee, the, the, the yobay. The trumpets were used to signal armies. They were blown to uh, signal a time of worship of the Lord. They were to call the people to assembly. And, and, and what we take from that is that one second, we're going to be going about our business in this life. And the next second, we will be gone at this blowing of this trumpet and present in the kingdom of God. The dead will be raised, we will be changed, and the resurrection of the saints will um, mark this overcoming of sin, overcoming of death. We know that Jesus was the first fruits of the grave, the first representing the many that would come after, and we become those ones that come after, those first fruits that come later. And so again, the most notable of this passage around the Scripture is again this idea of hope, but not the event, not you know, even the trumpet blast, but, but that whole idea of this event that the Lord is going to call us home one of these days is to help us to be steadfast, um, being steady and settled and unmoving in, in that faith that we have in Him, is to be immovable and, and having an intention that we won't move from that faith. And I think those two words have to go together. And then abounding in the work of the Lord. And again, that, that idea of abounding is large quantities of work. There's still much to do. We might be approaching the end and, and it feels like it in, in every indication is that we're approaching the end. we got lots to do. We don't get to sit down and wait. And, and that's not our hope. That I hope it's tomorrow because I don't want to do anything. It's like, there are people that we all care about and love that are headed for the wrong place. We all, man, we have a prayer meeting and there's some that's just that our hearts come out when we pray of those loved ones of the family and those that we just know that don't know the Lord. And so on one hand, we long for this day when the Lord takes us home but within that longing, we have a deep longing that our loved ones would come to the knowledge of the saving faith of Jesus Christ. The rapture is not 
a promise that we won't suffer. When we begin to get a little uncomfortable in this world, when politics don't look like we think they should, when schools don't look like we think that they should, when our economy doesn't look, whatever it is, things in our nation, when our leaders reflect things that are not consistent with what we believe, We often take that as a sign. We must be getting ready to rapture because things aren't going my way. And and that's that's not what this is about. There's not a promise that we won't suffer. In fact, I believe we're going to suffer greatly as Christians in the coming days. I believe it is every evidence is that is coming soon. And, and there's no evidence in the, in the Scriptures to say, you're, you, you don't worry about anything. You're never going to have a bad day. You're never going to suffer. In fact, it's completely opposite. says you will suffer. And, and you're, you're going to go through difficult times. And you better be steadfast and immovable in your hope because you're going to be standing there going, Lord, I want the rapture today. Can't, you're going to be longing for it. There's no hope that we won't suffer, and this isn't a license for poor stewardship of saying, well, the rapture's coming near I, again, that somehow I don't need to be a good steward as a Christian in this life. It's not uh, permission, as I said, to just wait and do nothing. And so we return to that idea that it started with this idea of the bridegroom, that there is a day that Christ will come uh, for His bride, the church. In a church as the bride would be in that day would be prepared, would be looking and longing and waiting and actively uh, prepared for His coming. Not surprised by it in any way. We know that we could see the passages of, and we'll see them as we study Revelation a little farther, where the Lord is coming, chapter 19. He comes with His saints. And we see in Zechariah, the Lord comes with His saints in tow. We see at the end of this tribulation, of this judgment, when the Lord sets foot down on earth, that it, it appears that He brings His saints with Him. And so for His saints to come with Him, um, He must first come for them. And, and so I think that's the uh, often the, the vision of when the Lord would return is confused with when the Lord will receive us to Him. And that causes some confusion in this understanding. I'll say, so, um, and there are many more scriptures about the rapture, but I want to at least take a moment to talk about timing, which seems to be so important to so many. And frankly, the more I study it, the less important it becomes to me. Um, the Bible does appear to show us the seven-year end times timeline uh, coming from Daniel. And again, we'll study that a little bit more as we get into it. Um, at the end of which, Jesus comes and He sets up His kingdom. This is sort of most uh, orthodox view, but there's many people that don't believe that too. Um, there, but n- nowhere do we see in this end times seven-year tribulation, do, we, do, do I see that we tie this rapture event to... Uh, to this seven years. And to tie this rapture event to this seven years makes the rapture predictable in some way. If the rapture happens first and it causes this uh, chain of events, then that may be what the Lord uh, sees. And you can, you can certainly speculate and come up with things that you say, well, that makes sense. And I don't want to speculate. You can find all kinds of speculations about it. And, and, it, and it does appear if the rapture were to happen, then you could see a chain of events that could lead you to that seven years and the things that we know must happen within that seven-year tribulation. But nowhere do I see that rapture tied to that seven years and, and all of the, the greatest evidence is the attitude of the first century believers that this could happen any day, any time. There's nothing that must happen first. So Titus said, for, um, or Phil said, the, 
Yeah, Paul. I get Phil. <laughs> Phil, I just made up another one. Phil. He was a little known apostle. For the grace of God, for the grace of God that uh, brings salvation has appeared to all men. Uh, teaching us that uh, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should uh, live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and a glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us uh, from every lawless deed and uh, purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. That's, that's Titus. And looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. That's the, again, this idea of it's a blessed hope. This is an amazing hope that has been given to us that we should hold fast to as a hope and, and not get pulled off into all the other directions of using it for other things. But that is a blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God. Luke said, but take heed to yourself lest your hearts be weighed down um, with carousing drunkenness and the cares of this life and that day come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on those who dwell on the face of the earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. It will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch therefore. Pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. How can you be worthy? But word always bothers me because... How can we be worthy? And we can't. Of ourselves, of our own flesh, we could never be worthy. And our worthiness is only found in Jesus Christ. To be found worthy, we have to be found in Christ. Look at this whole idea of rapture. It doesn't rely on you having a complete understanding. If the Lord snatches His people home one of these days, he doesn't, it isn't a pre-qualifier that you completely understand and that we all agree. And there was no indication in any of these end time things that these are things that should separate believers. That if you all don't believe exactly what I just said or what I believe in time and everything else, that there is something wrong with you. There's no indication we should be doing that. And way too many people are dwelling on those things. And it's wrong. And we, should, we should be steadfast and immovable in the hope that we have. Not in our understanding of the timing of it or how all this end time stuff fits together. It doesn't excuse us from the Scriptures, from studying them and take the things before the Lord. Let me read you one more thing. And uh, this is from the Didache. The Didache was the first century apostles. They didn't have a Bible to, to share. So they began to write down so this is not inspired scripture. No one anybody confuse it as such. But, but this is what they wrote down. Some of the concepts that to share with other believers and things that they should remember. And they came to this idea of the end times, and and they wrote a section on this. Be vigilant over your life. Let your lamps not be extinguished or your loins be ungirded, but be prepared. For you know not the hour in which our Lord will come. Come together frequently and seek what uh, pertains to your souls. For the, the whole time of your faith will uh, not profit you unless the last hour you shall be found perfect. Complete in Christ. Well, for in the last days false prophets and seducers will increase and sheep will be turned into wolves and charity will be changed into hate. For as lawlessness grows, men will hate one another and persecute one another and betray one another. This is talking about the church. And, and then there will uh, appear the deceiver of the world as though he were the Son of God and will work signs and wonders and the world will be delivered into his hands and, and he will do horrible things uh, which have not been done since the beginning of the world. Then shall all created men come to the fire uh, of judgment 
and many will be scandalized and perish. But those who persevere in their faith will be saved from the curse itself. And then will appear the first the signs of the truth. Of first the sign of confusion in the heavens. Second the sign of the sound of the trumpet. And the third the resurrection of the dead. Not the resurrection of all men, but as it was said, the Lord will come and all His saints with Him. And then shall the world see the Lord coming on the clouds of heaven. Father, thank You, Lord, for 